Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for being with us for this week's webinar from the Center for Learning, part of our fall semester. Um, I'm awfully glad to have with me two colleagues in ministry, Zach Stahowski and Jason Priggy, and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves in just a minute uh, when we begin the, um, the conversation portion of today's webinar. Before we get there, I want to do just a little bit of housekeeping um, for those of you who are joining us live. We are recording this webinar, so if there's something you miss, um, or if you have to drop off early, or if you have colleagues you would like to share this recording with, um, we will let you know when the recording is live, but we are recording this and we will post this to our website. I am posting into the chat, um, for those of you joining live, a link to the page on the Center for Learning website where the video will be posted. This is also where you can find the link to download the handout. So the handout has a couple of resources that might be helpful um, that we'll, we'll talk about or I'll reference later on, um, being able to evaluate your current practices of recruiting and training volunteers, some worksheets and things to get you started with some of the best practices that we'll, we'll discuss today, <clears throat> and really just some things to think about. So um, that PDF is available on the link that I just put into the chat, so please feel free to download it. Um, when we get to it, if we reference it in the conversation today, I'll share my screen. So if you're joining from your phone, um, or if you're not in a place where you're able to, to open another window or split screen, I uh, know you'll be able to see everything that we're talking about today. Um, I do want to make mention um, that on our website, you can find all of our upcoming webinars. Um, we have still 12 free webinars coming up uh, this fall. You can check out also in the next couple of days, we'll be opening registration for our uh, professional learning community that will take place in October, which will be a couple of weeks deep dive really into building a volunteer program, re recruiting, training, managing volunteers. So if you find today helpful and would like to go deeper, um, know that in the next couple of days, we'll open registration for that professional learning community that will begin in October. So you have a little bit of time to, uh, to check out the dates and to see who else you can bring along from your parish. Uh, that being said, I think that is everything else that we need. Oh, I'll, I'll mention too, again, you can continue to say hello in the chat. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the Q&A feature. So you can see us and hopefully hear us. Um, unfortunately, we cannot see or hear you. But if you have a question at any point in time in today's conversation, feel free to add it into the Q&A box, and I'll do my best to work it into the conversation with our panelists today. And if we run out of time, which I'm sure we will, um, I will do my best to be able to circle back to you with, with answers. Okay? I don't think I'm forgetting anything else. I'm sure I'm forgetting something else, but I don't, it's not apparent to me what I'm forgetting. Um, so let's begin. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Matt Reichert. I'm the director of the Center for Learning at OCP. We're awfully glad to have you with us today for our second fall semester webinar, looking specifically at the art of invitation. Um, how is it that we can best think about um, extending an invitation, lowering barriers to entry to encourage others to join our various parish ministries? Um, our conversation today is exactly that. It's very conversational with our panelists. I'll have them introduce themselves here in just a moment. I'll pitch out some questions, and we're hoping to be able to answer as many questions from you as well. If you are watching this recording, um, thank you for, for joining us after the fact. Uh, we hope you find today's conversation helpful. You can find more information about this conversation and the handout on the website for the Center for Learning, learnwithocp.org. Um, with that being said, panelists, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves. And Jason, since I see you on my screen first, um, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself first. Awesome. Well, great to be with everybody here today. Uh, my name is Jason Priggy. I am the Director of Youth and Young Adult Ministry here at Sacred Heart and Sock Rapids, which is part of uh, the One in Christ Catholic community in central Minnesota. So representing four different parishes uh, this afternoon. So Sacred Heart, Sock Rapids, Annunciation, Mayhew Lake, St. Francis Xavier, Sartell, and St. Stephen, St. Stephen. Um, if you're unfamiliar with central Minnesota, I would say like think Minneapolis, St. Paul, and like an hour west. And you can like pinpoint like smack dab in the middle of Minnesota. So that's that's where I'm coming uh, from today. Um, my wife works uh, for the Diocese of St. Cloud uh, in the business office. Uh, we live in Sauk Rapids, have for, uh, I would say, the past, oh, gosh, when did I move to Sauk Rapids? Like five or six years ago, let's just say that. 
That sounds like a good number. We have two young kids, um, AJ, who just turned six yesterday, and Addison, who is four. So a little bit about me and looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jason. It's great to have you with us. And Zach, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Zach Stahowski. Thanks, Matt, for the invitation to be with you all today. Um, I'm the Director of Music and Liturgy at Guardian Angels Catholic Church in Oakdale, Minnesota. I'm also the one of the co-directors of the One Call Institute out of St. John's University. Um, I'm a liturgical composer, uh, and I also um, I'm an author with uh, 23rd Publications, having co-authored some books with Matt here on the topics of liturgical ministry and uh, sacramental formation um, and uh, youth involvement in parishes. Yeah, great. Thanks, thanks, Zach, for being here, and thanks to you both. Um, for for those of you who are are joining us live, um, one of the things that I'm I'm excited about for today's conversation, and especially all of you who are with us, is the great array of ministries that all of you represent. And certainly with, with Zach and Jason, um, and to some extent myself, uh, we have a variety of experiences in parishes in different different states, music ministry, youth and young adult ministry, uh, religious education, Catholic school ministry. And so today, as we're talking about this important topic of recruiting volunteers, um, we'll, we'll do our best to talk about practices that really work for a variety of applications, um, really work for a variety of contexts. Um, so we're, we're glad to have all of you joining us um, participants and those of you who are watching after the fact, um, we're glad to have all of your various ministries represented. So let's kick things off, and um, I'm going to ask this question. Maybe Zach, if you could could kick us off here, um, thinking about this. Um, I, I think all of us are aware that it can be difficult to get volunteers, right? And I think most of us who are um, on this conversation um, have at least one segment of our ministry where we wish we had more help or we had more hands. So uh, so I don't think this is going to be a surprise to anybody that it can be difficult to find volunteers or difficult to recruit volunteers, difficult to keep volunteers. Um, in your experience, uh, what what are some of the common barriers to entry that either you hear about or you intuit that kind of stand in the way between people really entering into deeply or or serving or volunteering in in any of the ministries that you've led? You know what I what I have found recently in the last I don't know maybe five to ten years is people do a lot of their own research. Um, about a parish, about um, the different opportunities for serving at the parish um, before they'll even consider talking to someone who's, you know, in charge, perhaps. And I find one of the barriers, um, or at least one of the challenges that we're working through is that um, so many parish websites are not up to date. Um, the information is not current. They, it may have been written by someone who was in your position, you know, many years ago. Um, and so I have found that often the conversation maybe even gets shut down before it could even get started. Um, I think people are consuming information uh, in different ways. Um, you know, the bulletin is not uh, the silver bullet that it once uh, used to be. Um, and so I think having as much information readily available uh, that talks about the needs of what our parish needs, um, what the time commitment is, uh, the expectations, um, how to go about signing up, um, and then being able to follow that up with uh, personal invitations, with conversation uh, can be uh, really helpful. And of course, I mean, I think the other side of your question too, I think in this, you know, in, in the way that people are managing uh, their lives, of course, um, you know, after uh, the years of the pandemic, we, we keep hearing from all different um, areas about how people are managing their time differently, how people are um, becoming more discerning mm -hmm. about that. Um, we, we also have to figure out like how to make uh, these opportunities, these service things um, appealing to how people uh, discern what they're what they're giving their time to. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Jason, does that does that resonate with you and, and especially in your current current ministerial context? 
Yeah, yes, for sure. I, I do think like the means of communication is is, is a barrier, right? Um, you know, the bulletin, it it works. Like, don't get me wrong. I put things in the bulletin, but it is by far not the the only thing yeah. that I do. Um, here at uh, Sacred Heart in Central Minnesota, we have um, in our worship space we have screens, and so I I use I tend to use screens for my communication. Um, because it, we do like a pre-mass slideshow, right? Like, and so like there's these announcements floating around on screens. Um, there's um, there's always a staff present at liturgy, which I think is really helpful for that relationship piece. Where there's always that piece of contact, you know, where um, you're able to point people in the direction for a conversation. Um, but when it comes to barriers, I often think of like. Um, that sometimes our mistake is that we're looking at a production, that this is a production. Um, unfortunately, there is no award for the best volunteer, or like all these loopholes that you jump through, um, all the various training sessions. Um, and we're not looking for perfection, right? <laughs> um, and so unfortunately, there's no award for that. And I believe that it can sometimes be a barrier um, with so many hoops you have to jump through just to get on a schedule or just to be followed up with. I think that's a it's a common mistake made by um, people in my position that we just, we don't follow up. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we put out a plug, hey, we need help. We, we push a stewardship drive. Um, people sign up for things, but then who, how do we follow up? Where is that intentional conversation piece? And then, um, without making it so impossible to actually do the various thing that people are inquiring. Of. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder sometimes too, like it, it, it seems like one of the, um, one of the real dispositions that, that someone who's leading in a, in a ministry needs, especially when it comes to um, recruiting volunteers is needing to, to do perspective taking from the, the perspective of what, the way that our program is set up, what what does it what does the experience from the side of the volunteer um, really really project? And I think sometimes we, I think sometimes our prospective volunteers fill in gaps or make assumptions about what's required of them or isn't true for them because whether it's to your point, Zach, our, we don't have good you know up to date website information or to your point, Jason, we don't have multiple ways of sharing information, um, and and that can often get in the way. I think sometimes people assume, and maybe it's because our programs seem to be built in such a way that um, I need to show up ready to go, as opposed to. I have areas of interest. I have particular talents. I'd love to have a conversation about how I might use them and in what ways, what ways make sense for me, what ways make sense for a parish. And really it's a it's a dialogue um, as opposed to just a slot to be filled. Um, and I, 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 I wanna make sure to, to spike the ball on um, something I, I believe you both said, but I know you said it, Zach, the, the, the communication of what the expectations or time requirement is. Um, this is a situation that has happened in my parish. It's happened a couple of times just in the last few months, where I have friends who have said more or less the following. I would love to sign up to be a lector at our parish, but I always see Joe lector every Sunday. And I don't want to lecture every Sunday like Joe is. So therefore, I'm not signing up to lecture. And and of course, I want to say like, well, the reason Joe is lecturing every Sunday is because you haven't signed up, you know, like, but but there's no, um, I think people people make assumptions about a volunteer role based upon what they observe, because there isn't anything else that fills in that vacuum that we provide. Um, so I'm wondering, like Jason, I know you do you do a lot of work in your role, especially with youth, young adults, et cetera. Um, how do you help create, like, how do you help communicate time requirements or 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 um, or, or formation requirements? Or uh, how, how do you help paint that picture? How do you have that conversation or that dialogue? Yeah, great question. And I do want to touch on your point because I think there I think that's real. The life sentence thing, like once you say yes <laughs> yeah. to something, it's very real. Yeah. Like I think yeah. that exists. I just want to acknowledge that. Um 
So when it comes to time commitments, I think it's really important here, transparency, that communication of this is um, your time commitment. This is what we're asking of you. And here, and have the why. We know the how or what, but we need to know the why. Why is the time commitment this, as opposed to um, other various ministries? So I always like to have those conversations. Um, I know somebody might say like, hey, I want to be a small group leader. And I'm like, that's awesome. Um, but first, let's talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, I, I hear what you're saying. And I'm so glad you're interested. But can we meet up? Can we do coffee? Can you come over to my house? Can you come to my office? Um, I want that interaction because I think, again, that personal connection will help me better understand their desire and for me to more effectively communicate our need um, while best utilizing their charism, the gifts that they bring uh, to the table. Yeah. Uh, Zach, what what about, um, you know, as you think about uh, the the music ministry that you lead, and I know you haven't been at, at Guardian Angels for, for all that long, so some of this is still in, in its um, in beginning stages. Um, how do you how do you communicate those types of expectations, time commitment to a choir member or a cantor or an instrumentalist? Well, I think speaking of music uh, specifically, um, I think music ministry uh, really suffers the most from people making mm -hmm. assumptions about what they have to be before they even entertain the idea of possibly joining, right? So, um, you know, if I say so myself, my my choir sounds pretty good, you know, on on Sundays and especially at, um, you know, the big high holy days. Um, and I, what I've learned in talking to people who, like, I hear singing well in the assembly and, you know, inviting them to join is that they often have made the assumption, oh, you must have, you must be able to read music probably. Mm -hmm. uh, you must be like some sort of trained singer. And I think you can extrapolate this to other ministries about how people um, perceive uh, what's going on. So what that taught me a long time ago is uh, to make sure that the communication dispelling a lot of those uh, preconceived notions is, is top of mind. Um, so speaking specifically about music ministry, like in all of my recruitment communications, I'm pretty clear about like, we, you know, we meet from this time to this time, we need, you know, this kind of commitment to rehearsals, but you don't need to know how to read music or you don't need to be a professionally trained singer to, to help dispel some of that and I think maybe the more important thing that I've learned from that is it's just as important to engage with the people who are interested in signing up for your ministries uh, as it is to uh, engage with the people who initially are hesitant mm -hmm. um, uh, and maybe it's even more important to engage with those people a little bit deeper to to figure out uh, what is keeping you from this. What are your perceived uh, barriers? Um, but I think, uh, like as far as time commitments go, like you know, mu music ministry is is different than other liturgical ministries where it does require um, a more uh, frequent and um, perhaps demanding um, schedule, but with lectors or um, extraordinary ministers of the Eucharist or altar servers, um, what I've found is because of the way that we do scheduling specifically, um, people are able to set their own schedules. Mm -hmm. And I always lead with that because I know um, so often the response is, oh, I, I you know, we're, we're out of town so often during the summer or like, you know, things like, and I often say we would be happy even if you just were to serve one mess a year and you can tell our scheduling system that that's what you can do. Um, and so I think it, it helps to be accommodating of that and just, you know, lowering those, those barriers to entry. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I, I think those are those are points well made. And for for those of you who are joining us live, um, I wonder, you know, as as you think about in your own experience um, the the types of accommodations or 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 strategies you've used to lower the barrier to entry for volunteers. If you have some of those, put them in the chat so that the the rest of um, the rest of the the folks who are joining us can see those. Um, I I know that you know sometimes thinking about about music ministry again. You know, um, I think some of the examples that people often give for some of the barriers to entry can be the um, the the unconsidered requirements. Meaning, um, you know, I I know in in a parish where I served once, um, choir night was always Mondays at seven. And eventually, over time, decades later, as other people's schedules and things evolved, um, more and more people couldn't make it Monday at 7, so we transitioned to Wednesday at 7. Right? But for a period of time, the real challenge was, the barrier was when the rehearsal was. So we were able to make the accommodation to be able to consider what is it we require, is this the best way, is it serving us, Right, and we were able to change it. Right. Um, sometimes it's the the young person or the high school student or college student who can't make it in an evening because they have a part time job. And so maybe you as the music director or as an accompanist, you know, adds an extra period of time before the mass to be able to meet with that student individually for the sake of having them involved instead of not having involved, etc. Um, at some point, of course, though, there's there's a there's a hard stop, right? Or there's a limit, right? To the, the way that we can we can be accommodating because we also don't want the accommodating to, to suggest that anybody could or should do this or there's no preparation or there's no demand. There, there's, you, you should prepare when you're a lector, right? You should really know what you're doing if you are a catechist. Um, I, I'm wondering, Jason, if, if you could maybe talk a little bit about like how, how have you found that balance in lowering the barriers to entry, making those accommodations while still having the the necessary expectations for involvement and preparation, et cetera. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think so. I think that makes sense. I think that's, that, that is a challenge, right? And I, I think that takes um, true vulnerability mm -hmm. and risk. Um, I, you know, I don't always consider myself a gambling man, but that would be one instance where I'd gamble. I'd gamble on a young person for the sake of having them involved, because I do think it um, their gifts add something so deep and rich. Um, and I think that's true for any of our volunteers. I think everybody has those unique gifts and charisms that they do bring um, to the parish community. That's what make parish communities great. Um, and so one more time, man. So I, I lost my train of thought, but yeah, no, I'm just wondering, like when you when you approach your your the ministries that you're leading, let's say, you know, something with youth yeah. or young adult ministry, obviously you want to be flexible yes. right, to be in, yeah. and take that risk. Totally agree with you. And at, yeah. at what point, how do you still like manage to have the expectation where it's not just anything goes, show up if you want, right. et cetera? Yes. So that was I okay. Yep. Yeah. So that was a big adjustment for me when I stepped into being youth minister here, mm -hmm. um, because I, I'm not 100% certain there was that expectation mm -hmm. that you, um, if you're going to be in a leadership capacity as a peer minister, so that like a high school leader, um, that, you know, I just show up to meetings in youth group, and I don't do anything kind of thing. Like, I just, I'm an advisory. There's nothing wrong with having that advisory. But I think, you know, me coming in, I want to, I want to empower these young people. I want to practice like that keychain leadership. I want to, um, you know, a lot of things that one call has really helped with young people, um, you know, stepping up and uh, volunteering and taking a leadership role in parishes. Um, and it, it really does, it's sometimes uncomfortable. I'm going to be honest. It's uncomfortable to have the conversation like, okay, I understand that you have these various commitments. I can accommodate to an extent. Um, how can we compromise? How can we meet in the middle? to make this work. And perhaps maybe, you know, if this doesn't work, is there a different ministry we can plug you into? Hmm. You now say, okay, you know, peer ministry might not be your thing, but can I plug you in with, um, you know, the teen choir um, just down the hallway? Can I, you know, can you come like once every three months for a Sunday night rehearsal or yeah, Sunday night rehearsal and then come back the following weekend and sing? Like, is that a possibility? So 
allowing that opportunity, and this takes some trust from your coworkers or colleagues in ministry too, that they are willing to accept that young person or that young adult um, who does want to share their gifts, right? Yeah. Um, but again, I do, I keep circling back to that transparency, clear expectations, clear communication. Um, that way they just don't feel like a burden. They feel left out um, or just discouraged. I think that's that that, that can be pretty harmful. Yeah, I want to ask you some similar questions, Zach, how you find that balance between accommodating and having expectations. But I, I want to I want to make sure to to emphasize um, you know, a, a part of the point that you're making that I think is so important. And I'll, I'll reference this in the packet um, when when we get there in just a second. And that is, I think it's critical, first of all, that you understand all, all of these parishioners have something to offer. Right, that that we have a variety of gifts, we have a variety of talents, we have a variety of energies, and there's all kinds of different things that that folks can offer. How important it is that all of us as pastoral ministry leaders have an understanding of all of the various opportunities and needs and areas for involvement within our parish communities. So when we're having that conversation, maybe we discern this isn't the right fit. Maybe we discern this doesn't work, or maybe we discern this only scratches part of the itch and you have a whole other you know skill set that really would be great to use where do you send them where do you make those connections how do you encourage or advocate for them so to your point to be able to say maybe this does work as a peer minister maybe it doesn't work as a peer minister but from what i'm hearing from you in our one-on-one -on -one conversation you should really check out the teen choir and let me tell you where you go or who you talk to about that is really critical really critical especially now um Zach, music ministry, I'm sure you have all kinds of cantors or choir members who, you know, can't make it to certain rehearsals or certain things. Um, how do you balance the expectation along with accommodation? Well, I think it's important when anytime we're doing recruitment, uh, communications, that sort of thing, to really be careful about communicating what the full commitment is. I mm -hmm. think often we stop short um, if you take, uh, you know, the ministry of the lector, even uh, to say, you know, you can minister at such and such masses this many times a month or whatever, um, we often forget to say it also requires some preparation of, you yeah. know, study and prayer during the week. That's part of the commitment, for instance. Uh, same thing would go for a music ministry. There's all sorts of things that um, maybe we tend to leave out of the flyer um in terms of re rehearsal and preparation uh for rehearsal and then in terms of the balancing i think if if those initial communications um are in place they can serve as a template for evaluation and i know your handout uh, has uh, some great guidelines for um, having a constant evaluation, looking, engaging with uh, ministers and volunteers about how are we meeting expectations? And, you know, what can I as the, um, you know, the staff person uh, do better? What can uh, the volunteer uh, do to meet um, expectations? And I, I think if, if that conversation is ongoing, um, we're able to always be in communication about the balance so mm -hmm. that hopefully um, we don't get to a deficit where 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 things become difficult yeah. or you know or we have conflict and then i guess the last thing i would say about that too is i've i've been um in in the last couple of parishes i've worked in i've been suggesting a shift just in our language away from uh away from the idea of volunteering to say that um, it's by virtue of our baptismal calling and for those of us who've made the sacrament of confirmation in a sense we've already volunteered in some way to use our gifts in a ministerial way um, to uh, communicate to the parish everyone who's in attendance that in a in a way you've all volunteered to do something um, even if, if 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 the extent of that ministry is your your role as an assembly member, but along with it, uh, what sort of commitment does that carry? And then we get into the nitty gritty of like different ministerial roles. But I think to 
to orient the conversation the conversation to in um in the context that this is how we're fulfilling our baptismal call mm -hmm. not just these are the expectations of a volunteer um causes a little bit of a shift and i think it's easier to talk about um things in terms of commitment and expectations in that way yeah yeah no i that, that that's well said and, and i i mean i think it's so important obviously that when when we're talking about how we get to bedrock or the foundation of what we're talking about that it really does go back to that 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 culture of service that type of service that understanding of our our role within the community and and going all the way back you know as as you mentioned to that baptismal call I, I think one of the and and I I mentioned this with full acknowledgement that I have made this mistake many times and will likely make it again. I think many of the the, the um, I think many of us have been in a situation or have observed um, sort of a, a a problem when it comes to volunteering where we 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 worry about we we get in front of ourselves by filling in or contextualizing information based upon what we think the other person's concerns are so oftentimes i've heard um we really need more electors we really need lectures. it's not going to be that much time you don't have to worry about it we just really need somebody else and so would you please do this right and we we downplay the um the contribution we downplay the purpose we downplay this this the importance of this particular role we in doing so unintentionally downplay jason you have such a great spirit and heartbeat and gift and narrating voice it would be wonderful to have you serve we downplay to make it sound like we just really need somebody and anybody could do this and we're desperate so would you please do this right <laughs> which which now i think especially not not only generational research suggests but i think for all people regardless of generation coming out of the pandemic people are looking for ways to contribute people are looking for ways to serve People do want to be involved in a meaningful way where they can utilize themselves in, in to a greater, greater purpose and, and towards a greater mission, right? They do want that, but they have to see it and they have to know that it's going to happen. And if not, especially younger people, they're going to pass, right? They're, they're going to avoid anything where it seems like anybody else could do it, right? Even think about... Um, you know, uh, millennials and Gen Z and others, where most of our lives we've been told, right, we need to find our talents and abilities and serve in a way that is uniquely ours to contribute, because I have different skills than the rest of you on the call, and so I can contribute in ways that maybe others can't. Well, if that's what two whole generations have been told, and now the message is anybody or everybody could do this, it doesn't really matter, or that's how it's received. I might say, yeah, it'd be great if electors would volunteer, but I have to wait and find the thing that's going to work for me, right? So anyway, all this being said, I think it, it is a balancing act, and I, I don't think we should be afraid to say exactly what both of you are suggesting. Let's have a conversation about where we can negotiate, but here's the minimum. This is the, the real purpose of what I'm asking you to do, and the difference that it will make in the life of this worshiping community and therefore the church and the world and this is why i think you would be wonderful in this particular role now let's talk about how we make that happen and that's a very different conversation than oh my god we're desperate we really need people so please just sign up and we can make figure out how to make it work right and that's 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 a challenge right um, I want to take this um, uh, second to pause. I'm going to share my screen. Um, for, for those of you joining live, I put into the chat the link to the handout. Um, and uh, those of you who are watching this after the fact, um, it's hyperlinked on the same page where you found the video recording. Um, I want to, want to point out a couple of things that might be helpful in terms of framing our thought process, um, might also be helpful in terms of looking at your um, parishes or your particular ministry in your parishes practice and how you might chart a path forward. Um, first of all, and I'm, we're not going to go through all of these things, but um, we have a list here, 10, 10 best practices or 10 things to think about for recruiting volunteers for your parish ministry, whatever it might be. Um, I do want to emphasize these, these first two, identifying and articulating needs and sharing vision and mission. And what I mean by that is um, we, we need to do a good job as leaders within the church of identifying and articulating the various needs within our parish community, both the, the and to use, sorry to use real practical language, but the openings that we have now 
we need more lectors, and also just the various ways that people are serving. Lecturing is a thing that you can do in order to serve and participate in our liturgical ministry. We need to identify and articulate that. We also need to share the vision and mission in terms of, here's our parish mission, right? I'm assuming everyone on the call, your parish has a mission statement. I'm also willing to bet, and I'm assuming most of you don't know it, right, or can't articulate it. I know I can't articulate my parish mission. Maybe that's more of an issue of me than, than my parish's mission statement. But do we know what the purpose or the mission or the vision for your music ministry or your young adult ministry is? How is what we do in music ministry supporting our overall ministry mission as a parish? And there, then, how does being in the choir help support that mission, which helps live into the reality of what we're proclaiming as a parish? Right? And the reason I'm mentioning that as, as something that's important is because as we are inviting people into service, we're asking people in a particular way to give of their skills or talents or abilities, um, again, they will do it. But we oftentimes have to, to link and say, Zach, here's what I see in you, and here's what I'm hearing from your interests and abilities, and this is how I think this role given what it does to help accomplish the vision or purpose of music ministry, will really help our parish community because we are a people who blank. That's a very different ask. That's a very different parameter for a conversation than about time commitment and about investment and involvement and preparation, et cetera, as opposed to, can you be here on Thursday at seven or not? Right. So, so anyway, all this is to say, I want to point out that these 10 best practices, take a look at them, consider them for your parish community. Um, we also added some reflection questions at the end to help you or or you share this article with your colleagues um, to, to look at this and consider maybe where there are opportunities and, and where there are strengths within your community you can build off of. Um, the the next um, uh, list, this checklist, um, is a way that can help you at least begin to think, begin to have a conversation with others in your community about what you're doing right now in terms of volunteer practices. So um, things like, does your parish have a mission statement? Yes or no? And then given your response, what what's some action step you could take? I'm not suggesting you go out and write or edit um, individually your parish mission statement, but consider that next question. Does each ministry have a purpose statement that's aligned to your parish mission? Do I understand how being a part of faith formation within my parish helps us accomplish our mission as a parish community, et cetera? Um, there are some of these that might be difficult questions to answer, not only um, meaning they might be challenging to find the right information to answer, they might be challenging in terms of what the answer is. Generally, do volunteers have a good idea of what's expected of them? Uh, I'm just gonna take an honest, honest response. Right? Um, are staff members aware of the gifts and talents and interests of parishioners? Right? Are, are potential volunteers given a position description when they're invited? In other words, do people know what they're being invited into, not just in a conversation, but do we have something where we can say, here actually is that description, right? So anyway, all this is to be said that these, these 25 different questions can help you assess now, and maybe later you come back to assess again your current volunteer practice. And then the final thing I want to point out for, for right now is um, I, I'm a big proponent of role descriptions for various ministries or volunteers within within my, my ministry that I participate in. And I'm not saying we have to be very legalistic about this, but but I find as an act of invitation, it's helpful to have, here, here's a page that gives information for what it means to be a cantor. Here's the purpose, right? But that can provide some you know catechesis as well about that role. Here's the purpose and what the key responsibilities are. Here's who you would work with. Here's how you're scheduled. Here's what the qualifications are. Here's what you know we will commit to for you for training. And so you know what you need to, to do, participate in ministry day, or you need to come to rehearsal, or you need to do these types of preparations, right? Again, it doesn't have to be legalistic. It doesn't have to scare people away, but something that is honest, transparent, that you can hand to people, that you can deputize others to be able to hand out to people, right? When you see someone at mass and they sat behind you and they have a voice like an angel, right? You can point them to where they can find this information. Um, something like this, I'll also say, 
um, and then I want to get back to our questions, um, is helpful not only in terms of the invitation, but this is also helpful in terms of ongoing formation and feedback and managing of volunteers. Right? If it, we know it can be difficult, not impossible, but difficult to sometimes manage out or fire a volunteer if you want to use that 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 approach. Um, and sometimes it can be difficult because we don't have something to really go back to. These are the key responsibilities for this ministry because of its purpose. Are you able to commit? Can we find a way to make it possible for you to commit to those responsibilities? And if not, maybe we need to transition you here. But these responsibilities have to be done, right? And the, the final word I'll mention here too is keep in mind as you consider doing something like, like this, there are maybe responsibilities or, or qualifications that your parish or your diocese or the universal church might have for a particular ministry, right? So there are certain qualifications that just need to be met in order for someone to serve as an extraordinary minister of Holy Communion. Perhaps their diocese has requirements for what, what needs to be true for someone to serve as a cantor. Or maybe your parish discerns that we want the following to be true for someone who serves as a cantor in liturgical ministry, right? So this is a great opportunity to be able to document or, or have a conversation about those as well. So I wanted to point this out that these are some of the resources that are available in your packet in case it's helpful um, aligning to some of the things that we're talking about. Um, uh, Zach or or Jason, when when you're thinking about the ministries that you lead or have led, um, maybe not in such a formalized way, but but have you had um, any sort of like description, purpose statement, something like that that you've been able to develop or use um, both in the inviting or the managing of volunteers that have assisted you in your ministries? Um, yeah, I so I have. Um, I actually, it's kind of funny. So yes, I, to answer, yes, I have, I've done this in my previous, uh, parish community done a little bit here. Um, but we're actually like in the phase of, so young adult ministry for this community is fairly new within like the past couple of years. Um, and so, yes, I, I think we're still trying to flesh that out or what that even looks like as a young adult team. So it's it's been part of our meetings, especially this year, to kind of develop what that means and what that looks like in young adult ministry. And then the same is true for youth ministry. Um, we just kind of rebranded that, if you will, into kind of a new concept, kind of a young life model uh -huh. of, of youth ministry. And so that that will definitely require some intentionality to update um, kind of those descriptions and roles, yeah. what that means, what's, what does that look like? So yes and no <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. in that process i think that naturally um as you change things in ministry because i i think you know naturally that just happens and you should be doing that and you shouldn't always have the we've always done it this way kind of thing because those things do shift and um and it takes work to be honest yeah yeah how about you Zach, for, for for music ministers what do you usually just tell them about what that role looks like I mean, we've often, what I've often done is really try to orient us around whatever the parish mission statement uh, is, uh, because that is usually something that's not going to change, um, whether I am the music director or whether there's someone who comes after me, which I think is important. And I think um, I would want to highlight um, just the portion of what you were saying, Matt, is that to have these um, like guidelines, expectations, visions, mission statements documented um, is super important because very often they're not. Yeah. Um, I know like for me, I, I have some holes and gaps in our liturgical ministries currently that like we know what to do. We know how to train everyone. I don't know if it's always necessarily written down. Um, and we we rely on the fact that you know there are enough people who know what's going on. However, um, the problem that I've been um, uh, kind of like steeped in over the last couple of years is what happens when there's a significant number of turnover in either volunteers or staff members. Like, how do you transition beyond that? Um, and having these. Uh, these kind of things documented um, can really help 
uh, to, to, so that um, the ministry's expectations, these processes of invitation are not necessarily um, centered around a specific individual, yeah. but are, are a part of the living fabric of the parish. I mean, that's, that's the best way that you can be prepared for, you know, eventual uh, staff turnover or, you know, volunteer turnover. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's right. And, you know, one of the things that I've found can be helpful too in, in having these descriptions um, is, I mean, frankly, and, and, and let's, let's be honest, like it is, it is intimidating and it is challenging trying to think about recruiting volunteers because how do you do it right if you have a large or small parish community if you think about well i need to i need i need more lectors if you don't have a way to narrow down and be specific then if you have 5000 members of your parish then you're looking at 5000 potential conversations and that's really not what we're looking at we we can use these descriptions not only to to clarify those individual conversations but also to narrow down what who is the ideal candidate that we're going after, right? Um, if you if you think about using um, in uh, uh, recruitment of volunteers, kind of like how how you would think about fundraising, right? If I need someone who can make a gift of a particular dollar amount, it's going to limit the number of people that I might be able to ask or might consider asking. If I'm if I'm if I start by thinking about who my ideal candidate is. If I start thinking about the the skills or the um, uh, past history experience availability that I might be looking for, suddenly I'm narrowing down the potential pool of people that I could, should, must have a conversation with, or the people that I must need to identify or need to invite. Right. So, so all that is to to all that is to say that having some of these role descriptions, formalized or not, available in a variety of places. Um, not only helps in terms of that dialogue, but it can also help just in in terms of cutting this down into actual bite-sized pieces instead of trying to swallow the whole thing in one bite. Um, the other thing I, I want to mention too, um, and, and, and again, for those of you who are joining us live, if you have other questions, please put them into the, uh, into the chat, is um, I, I found a helpful litmus test for me is um, how would anybody know the information that I am expecting from them. And if the answer is, well, they should just know it, that then, then I'm the problem, right? There needs to be all kinds of ways that information has been communicated and made available in a variety of places. I also um, am trying to uh, be good about reminding myself that I might need to be in charge of driving the process to recruit volunteers what in whatever ministry it is, but that does not need to mean that I am the only inviter, right? I need to find a way to deputize or involve others in, in order to um, facilitate the process, whether that is bring me names of people who you think, you know, have these skills or might be interested in these things, and I will reach out. Or you reach out to people who are, like, I, I can deputize members of my choir. I can deputize members of my young adult ministry, right? I don't have to do it all. And really, if we create a culture of service and a culture of invitation, that's going to, to help out. So again, if the only way someone would know it is because of information I'm holding on to, that's a problem. And if I'm the only one who's doing these things, I'm I'm limiting very much the way that this type of invitation is going to, uh, to flow out naturally. Um, I, I want to, uh, get to a, a variety of things in the, um, the, the limited time that we have left, but let me, let me, for the both of you paint, um, paint this sort of picture to you, um, how, how do you, so Zach thinking again, back to, to music ministry, um, how, how do you move from I've heard from, or it's been identified to me, that so-and-so has some sort of musical ability or interest. How do you move that, that spark of information, that first sort of you know, blip on the radar screen? Like, how, how do you work with them, communicate with them, move them from that initial indication to service in your music ministry? Like, I, I, really what I'm asking for is, like, what are the various ways that you think about conversing, inviting, to move them into considering uh, joining your music ministry? 
Well, I mean, I think we all know, like, there's, there's nothing quite as effective as that very personal level of engagement. Um, so when, when that gets communicated to me, um, I often try to get some sort of point of contact, whether it be phone call or email, just to say, hey, this person had glowing things to say about you and your musical abilities, uh, to then give them all of the opportunities um, in ministry uh, that we have, and to just, you know, start that beginning uh, conversation about invitation. This is open to you. Um, our ministry would be better um, with you as a part of it. Have you considered uh, using your gifts in this way? Um, if now is not the time, just, you know, always uh, keeping the conversation going to let them know that the door is always open. Um, and, and, and from my end, too, to, to make sure that uh, the music ministry in this particular instance or ministry in general has enough opportunities and flexibility that we are, you know, without having to jump through, you know, too many hoops, mm -hmm. um, are able to, um, you know, meet people where they are and, and hopefully bring them in in some capacity. Yeah. Jason, when, when you, um, when, when you have experienced or or led successful right invitation efforts or invitation conversations what 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 does that look like like what do, what is your practice now how do you facilitate these types of invitation conversations well first if if a name gets passed along i'm like yay <laughs> like that's so <laughs> exciting um what tell me more <laughs> you know um, and so like Zach, give me that contact information. And it's, it's seriously within, well, I get so excited about these things because sometimes I feel like it just doesn't happen to me. So like, it's usually the same day or within even in front of the other individual, like I'm like dialing the phone number. Like I am so I'm calling this person and then, uh, either leaving a voicemail or leaving the room because they actually picked up the phone, which is also Kind of a challenge, right? Um, I leave a lot of voicemails. I don't know about Zach or Matt, you guys, but um, but anyway, so it is exciting when they pick up. And um, I ask a lot of questions, hmm. um, so, it, along with saying giving the amount of praise, right? So when somebody's, you know, somebody obviously saw your God-given gift, somebody saw this a strength in you. Um, I'm just calling. Let me tell you more about this ministry. Um, I just did this about a month ago for a young adult team member. Um, you know, fairly new to the community, expressed huge interest in young adult ministry. Um, we sent we sent her and her husband a card, you know, kind of welcoming them, um, but then never heard from them. Yeah. Like they just kind of fell off the face of the earth. And I just went on a whim. I'm like, I gotta call this, I gotta call this woman. And so I picked up the phone, gave her a phone call, and she goes, I've been waiting. I've mm. been waiting for somebody to say something or to reach out. And I'm like, well, awesome. Let me be that individual. Um, and so after talking about some of the things that we're doing, and she told me a little bit about her role and her job and what she does, I'm like, you know what? You would be perfect to be on our young adult team. Can you can you come to a meeting? And um, and actually tonight is going to be that first time that, you know, she gets, I get to meet her and she's going to do this meeting. So I'm uh, pretty excited about it. But yeah, it, it really does. Um, it takes that initial leap of trying to bridge that gap of getting people into um, various ministries. So yeah. just kind of a success story in that, that I wanted to share. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And and I, I think you're exactly right that, that the, to, to express gratitude and enthusiasm for, for the, the possibility that there might be someone who's involved in a particular way is great. I know it, it seems odd, but you know, it's true that Oftentimes, it seems like that 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 name suggestion or that inquiry or that question, or whatever, can come at an inconvenient time, and sometimes it's easy to think about it as a nuisance as opposed to as something that we can we can be excited about. So I think that celebration is really helpful, um, and to to act, I think I think that's one of the dangers, right? We we identified at the beginning that it can be hard when we do things like Stewardship Sunday or the Volunteer Fair. First of all, it's hard when we do it just once a year instead of realizing that this is an ongoing 12-month year process. But it can be difficult when we get the roster of people, people put down their names, and then no follow-up has happened. You know, nobody has nobody has called me even though I put my name down, right? Um, we have a, a, a question in, in the... Um, 
in the chat um, from one of the participants, Elaine, who's describing, you know, a situation where we we might have had people who identified, you know, on a survey an interest in serving in a particular way, but then when um, when you know they're reached out to either don't respond or might not respond favorably. Um, Zach, as you think about, I don't know that this has ever happened to you, but but you know, I mean, if you're at Guardian Angels and somebody put down on a list, I might be interested in joining the choir, and then you reach out to them and they're not interested in joining the choir. Like, how do you how do you handle that situation, or what what do you do with that? Well, I think um, you know what what Dana's uh, response was when she asked, "Have you asked these potential greeters what's holding them back?" I think that is an important question. You know, Elaine responded, "I like to focus focus on the positive, not negative." I don't think it's necessarily a negative hmm. um, here. It's it's important information. So, like, what about uh, the ministry or whatever this process um, that happened ended up? Uh, yielding uh, like contradictory results, I think mm -hmm. is going to be a, a really important thing uh, to figure out. Now, uh, speaking very specifically, when this has happened uh, in music, usually what happens is, I like just this last go around. We always do um, like uh, these these campaigns. We call them our time and talent campaigns, where you know people get asked in the pews to submit a form. Uh, or fill out a form if they're interested in ministry. And I got um, a couple uh, inquiries about the Cantor ministry. Um, and in, in one conversation I had with uh, a person, um, they just said, you know, I'd really just, I really just want to sing solos for people. That's, and I was like, well, let me That's honest. Let's talk about, <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about what the, uh, what the ministry of the Cantor is, you know, and then um, just and and I said, you know, if if you're willing to go down th this road, this this, I, I think we could really use your gifts in this way. Like when you're ready mm -hmm. to do that, um, for this person that was really not of interest to them at, at at this point. But I hope the door is open. Um, and um, like and so like it it seems odd to me that there would be a situation where like someone is just sitting in the pew saying oh yeah i'd be interested in being a greeter and then you call and they say uh no i'm not interested in being a greeter. unless you know you know life happens and things change mm -hmm. but i i would be really uh wanting to uh, examine uh like the whole chain of communication to see where the breakdown was yeah. um or where the m misunderstanding was because i i think you're going to learn a lot about um you know your your process that way yeah. Or, yeah tell me more about that you know yeah with that follow-up question i want yeah i want to know more i think it i think it's also um interesting to consider as as names are suggested to us or as we meet people or observe from people or depending on our new parishioner form sometimes you know parishes will ask questions about you know potential um areas of ministry or talents um think about what you do with that information and how you track it um, think about the the normal ways you communicate within your ministry and how you might add potential participants in that ministry to that list. So, for example, when I was director of worship for our area Catholic community, anybody who expressed an interest or was recommended to me as a musician, I would reach out to and I would add them to our regular communication list. Now, you don't want to bombard people with with information or music or, or uh, 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 emails, rather. Um, but I found that by by constantly including them, by by including them in the segment of people I knew were interested in music ministry, we 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 eventually got to a point where they always had enough information. So whatever was causing them to say, not now, not yet. When that thing changed, they knew what was happening and could jump in no problem. And so eventually, you know, if, if I had 10 names suggested to me of cantors, maybe only two worked out now, but I kept the other eight and on the distribution list. And eventually within the next year, nine, eight or nine of those 10 were there and were ready. Um, so it's not just the, I reached out to you, have the one conversation and then that's it. Um, I think also, you know, a couple of things just related to, to some of the stuff I'm seeing in, in the chat and some of the questions, um, you know, one accommodation that might be helpful, this is another music ministry example, but I found a lot of success and I know other people um, that I've had conversations with have found success in thinking about ministry, especially music ministry, like you mentioned, Zach, which just is a different type of commitment from a, a, a seasonal perspective. 
So within my parish community, we started to do like the Advent and Christmas choir. So we could say, it's not just come and sing for Christmas Eve, it's Advent Christmas season. Here's what we're singing. And it's a great time because it's it's that time of year. People are home. Oftentimes it's familiar music or familiar melodies. Um, but if I can say to someone, come and join the choir for these two months. Again, you know, people think that, you know, like you mentioned, Jason, I don't remember how you phrased it, but like the idea that you're doing a life sentence, right? Once I join the choir, I can never leave. It's not Hotel California, but I'm joining for two months. And we know what it's like to make music with people. Once you're there, it's hard to step back. Or also, if I need to step back, it's okay, but I'm there for those two months. So I think sometimes some of that can be helpful. Um, we have some some information or some uh, comments or questions too about um, what do you do about um, uh, basically questions related to how do you create that welcoming community? Um, I think this is something that we need to be um, aware of as we're, we're looking at the culture of our own particular ministry. People have a desire to serve people are also looking for belonging. And I think sometimes if we don't intentionally provide opportunity to create that welcome and belonging, we unintentionally block people from finding that belonging in our ministry. And I'll give an example. My parish community growing up had a fantastic choir, adult choir, wonderful adult choir. And these members really, like it was, it was like their social group. The challenge of that, and it wasn't that people weren't kind, but the challenge of how what what good friends and what a tight social knit group this choir was, is that without the intentionality, others who came to join didn't feel like they belonged. And now my parish community has no adult choir because that adult choir aged out basically and couldn't retain new members. We didn't find a way intentionally to create that type of belonging within the community. Not everyone has to be everyone's best friend or get invited to everybody's barbecue, right? But we have to be careful about how we create that welcoming. So if you're in a, a, a multi-generational ministry, multicultural ministry, whatever that might be, how are we intentional so that we can avoid any of the, um, the unintended messages of not belonging, not being able to participate? Because that, that creates a, a problem going forward also. Um, in that we have we have about three four minutes left or so. I see a question um, uh, in terms of communication about opportunities, invitation, um, you know, uh, opinions on father making an announcement about joining the choir or other ministries. This person has found that if father says it, it works. Um, so in in uh, J Jason, you know, and then you Zach, like in your experience, to get even the invitation or message out that there's a possibility, like what what seems to work for you? What have you found is best? Yeah, I, I, I do think there's that mentality, um, but I, I, I'm going to say something a little controversial here and say, I think that's generational. Um, I think there is some generation, you know, father said it, therefore it's true, I will do it. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, I think people in my generation and maybe younger, Gen Z, millennial, um, would really look for um, that personal invitation sometimes it, you, you don't get that as much when you stand up front in front of the whole assembly and say that. I think that there's times where that is helpful. I think video messaging is helpful. Graphic design is helpful in that. But it's really, I, I find it to be more successful. And, you know, to pull something out of the Protestant hat here of having people in that gathering space as contact points or those dialogue things. Um, and so, yes, I think that does work to some extent, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I don't think it's the only way. Yeah. Yeah, what about your experience? I, think I would just add, I think um, one of the strategies I use too is if, if I make an announcement to the parish, um, in addition to you know inviting people to join something or to volunteer something, I'll also say, um, and also everyone here, if you know of someone yeah. who has these gifts, because the people are always happy to nominate someone else to yeah. do something. <laughs> exactly. um, and I think that's that's an important piece. And it's, you know, specifically about music ministry. I where I'm sitting, I don't know who the voices are necessarily out in the assembly. Like I actually do need the assistance of parishioners to make those nominations. And people love to do that, yeah. you know, yeah. and you can extrapolate that to to any ministry. Um, yeah. So 
you know, yeah, that, that idea of a name campaign is huge. And I think it's also helpful and, and can be meaningful too when someone calls and says, you know, Zach, we're looking for this and people saw this in you. Would you be interested in having a conversation about what this could look like? There, that, there's a different type of, again, feeling of belonging or awareness, or mm -hmm. we see these gifts in you. Yeah. Let's have a conversation about what they are. That can be meaningful as well. Yeah. Um, and yeah, flattery. Right, it, flattery. It goes, yeah. it goes a long way. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so a couple of things to keep in mind is we're, we're out of time here. I want to, um, I want to encourage you as you're thinking about, again, recruiting volunteers, do you know who and what you're looking for? Right, because once we can identify who it, the type of person or the type of candidate and what it is we're looking for, we can start to narrow down. If we can deputize or, deputize or utilize other people to help create that name campaign, I think that's that's also really helpful and important. We we can't nor should we get away from the fact that we need to have an inv invitation or as personal a conversation as we're able to have to invite people. We need to be able to think about really what are the limits of where we can accommodate or not. What's the purpose, the bigger purpose of what we're what we're looking for? Um, so, in all of these, as we're chipping away at these um, th these abilities, uh, or excuse me, these strategies of identifying individuals, their particular gifts, creating conversation, realize that in all of these conversations, if you talk to ten people, maybe you'll get two volunteers, but the other eight conversations are not wasted. Right as you as you have that individual conversation, as you begin to identify someone, you know them more deeply, their heart more deeply. Keep track of that so you know how you might pass that off and say, "Oh, Jason, I've got someone for you because I just talked to so and so about this and it didn't work out." Right. So keep in mind that all of this time and effort is not wasted. Certainly, in terms of just the the overall ministry and way that we can be present to others within our parish community. Um, continue to share ideas with one another. Certainly, again, we just scratched the very, very, very top of the surface here. Um, these resources we had given you in your handout, please use them, modify them, adjust them, however they're useful to you. We're, we're happy to provide them. Um, please keep an eye out for our upcoming professional learning community where we will go in deep into all the various levels and various process of creating um, volunteer strategies where we'll be able to um, to assist more directly in what, uh, what these strategies might look like in your parish community. More information will be coming out about that October series. Um, and if there's any other way that the Center for Learning or Jason or Zach or myself or others who are part of our fall semester can be useful, please don't hesitate to reach out. And as always, thank you for everything that all of you are doing in your ministries to help them grow, to help them thrive, to help them flourish, to help um, and all the conversations you will have with others to help them identify and utilize their own abilities and talents in service of the church. Um, thank you for all of that. Again, it is not wasted effort. It's so critical and important for our church and our world. Um, so thank you all. Jason, Zach, thanks so much for being here and sharing your, your wisdom and your experience. And I hope to see all of you on a Center for Learning webinar coming up soon. Thanks. thanks. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. God bless. Yeah, thanks.